second uh, presenter is none other than uh, Dr. Willard Ashley. Uh, he is known throughout the country and around the world for his work um, in this and other areas. He is a, a professor at uh, New Brunswick Theological Seminary. He is a pastor. Uh, he is an all around contributor uh, to the well being of individuals and systems that serve individuals. So, without further ado, uh, can we bring up our presenter who is going to take us on an overview of, of, of trauma? And uh, from that point, we'll be followed by three panelists specially chosen for you. So, I turn it over uh, to our dear brother, our dear friend, and leader, uh, Dr. Willard Ashley. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Wyatt. It, it's been good to know each other over over the, <clears throat> over the decades, <laughs> and God and God God has been kind to both of us. And so, I always count you as 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 a friend, and and I keep on learning more and more from you. So, thank thank you. I just thought it was important in talking to folks from Brooklyn that you have an appreciation that I'm a New Yorker. I'm not some import, you know, I'm not some out of towner that knows more about New York than you do. I, I'm, I'm from New York, born and raised at Columbia, Columbia Presbyterian Hospital, Washington Heights, played baseball in a Harlem Little League, was staff psychotherapist at Riverside Church, and my son lives in Brooklyn. So I just thought it was very important because, you know, as a New Yorker, you know, we have feel a little funny when folks from outside come in and try to start talking to us. So I thought it was important that you realize that. And I just want to say thank you to New York City Thrive for this invitation to share with you on a topic that is near and dear to, to my heart. So just wanted to start with that. If we can change the next slide. So what is trauma? As Dr. Wyatt said, we, we are each experiencing trauma. We, we, we're going through it, but let's just give it some, some definition. You know, being an academic, you want to define your terms. And, and so what is trauma? Well, the etymology of trauma, if you, if you go back, it goes back to the 17th century Greek, and it means wound. And if you're a clergy person, uh, you probably read Henry Nouwen, The Wounded Healer. If you are a medical person, then you probably read the wounded storyteller. And, and so we come into this work as caregivers, wounded, if you will, because we've been traumatized. We've had a deeply disturbing or distressing experience or put an S on that experience is. And usually that's some sense of emotional shock following a stressful event or events, if you will, physical energy or injury, which can be associated with the physical shock. And sometimes, sometimes it leads to long-term neuroses and post-traumatic stress disorder. I'm gonna just put a little pin right there because I'm, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna do a self-confession, if you will, that I suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder not because I went to Vietnam, not because of other reasons you may think associated with normal war. I grew up in Harlem and I heard one too many gunshots. And so I shared that sometimes I'm walking down Sixth Avenue by Radio City or any public street in New York City and a car backfires and it's embarrassing because I run for cover. Because in my upbringing, when you heard that noise, somebody was getting shot at if it wasn't you, you duck behind a car. And, and so post-traumatic stress disorder comes in many different forms, if you will. And when we talk about trauma, it does trigger a, a, a response. And that's my response. That's how I've been, quote unquote, traumatized. And, and so it can happen by um, racism. And if you're turning on the television, looking at the news, we're traumatized by not eight minutes, but now we realize it was nine minutes. And what does that mean? Traumatized by, by the violence, by economic insecurity, abuse, grief. And who's not grieving right now? All of us are grieving. I'll say more about that in just a moment. And just other negative life events. Next slide. 
And so psychological trauma causes damage to a person's mind due to one or more distressing events causing overwhelming amounts of stress. Because all of us are stressed, but there's a point in time when the stress is just overwhelming and it exceeds a person's ability to cope. And eventually it leads to serious long-term negative consequences. And just wanted to be very careful because I, I fight with some of my, my, my clinician colleagues that we don't want to pathologize too soon. And many of us are going through normal reactions to being traumatized, dealing with COVID-19 and all that goes with it. So we'll say, we will say more about that as we go on. Just want to flag that. Next slide. So the COVID-19 pandemic may be producing other types of trauma. There's racial trauma, talking about testing and, and, and access and hesitancy and, and, and lack thereof and who gets tested, who now gets the vaccine and the history around it and watching what happened, the events unfold in, in Washington and other places, racial or racialized trauma. There, there's congregational trauma. Because if you are a clergy person, regardless of your faith practices, we've been having to deal and carry the burdens of our congregation and their anxiety and their trauma. And, and this clergy trauma, I mean, I don't know any clergy person from any faith tradition that can't say that he or she has not been traumatized over this past year in all the events that have taken place. And then, of course, um, if you're a clergy person, you and I both know that there's no such thing as just our congregation. It's the community. And so the communities in which we serve, they, they are traumatized, if you will. Hope I'm in the right building. And so next, ne next slide. So um, one of my mentors who became a close friend, who honored me to allow me to give her eulogy upon her passing, Phyllis Harrison Ross, who was a psych, who was a pediatrician, became a psychiatrist. She was psychiatrist to the stars, if you will. She was the founder of what they call AMHA, the All Healers Mental Health Alliance. She was considered the mother of black psychiatry. And she would say to me, she'd say, Will, when you treat people, tell them, you know, sort of being totally psychotic that there's nothing wrong with you. And even if they were psychotic, there's nothing wrong with you. What has happened to you is wrong. Let's talk about it. So let's talk about it. Next slide. So what are some of the symptoms of trauma? You have trouble focusing. As a professor, I'm telling my students, don't be so hard on yourself that you can't get the paper in on time because I'm having a hard time reading it once you wrote it. It's <laughs> so we're having a hard time being able to focus. To, to, the feelings that interfere with our daily life become, uh, they, they come all of a sudden, it's, it's a whole, it's a, it's a task, it's unmanageable. Just going to the store now becomes such a big deal. Feeling hopeless and helpless and you and I know as clergy, that, that's rough because we don't want to want to say on Sunday, you know, or Saturday or Friday night that there's always hope. And some days we're like, uh, uh, yeah, right. There's always hope. There is always hope, right? And we don't feel it ourselves. There's a sense of, of a loss of control. I'm not in control. I couldn't decide when I want to go out, when I don't want to go out, because the government, rightfully so, says that these are some restrictions you need to honor. You need to put on your mask and so forth. I, I, I want to go to the movies. The movies wasn't open, so a loss of control. And if we're honest and we're talking to each other, yeah, there's increased anger. And yes, we are more irritable than normal. We might tend to be irritable, but now we're more irritable if that's possible. And, and there's a point where we avoid family and friends. I know there's moments at the end of the day, I've, I've heard enough about trauma, I've heard enough about everybody else's problems. I do not want to be bought. Leave me alone. Leave me alone, all right? And and we go through that. We're hypervigilant. We're looking over our shoulder. We, we spray the box. We wipe down the envelope. We make sure we take off our things and put them in a bag and send them to the cleaners or wash them. But we're also making sure and looking over our shoulder. We're hypervigilant. 
As I told you before, we deal with post-traumatic stress disorder. Some of my colleagues may use some other terms, but that's the one I'm going to stick with for now to keep me out of trouble. And, and we have persistent negative thoughts and we have mood changes and would again, chronic stress and well, I'll just put it this way. In the beginning of the pandemic, we learned in our household that if you don't bring, if you bring Oreo cookies in the house during a pandemic, you're doing yourself a disservice because they didn't last but 15 minutes. And we both are professionals, we know better, but boy, did those Oreo cookies sure taste good. Need I say much more? Some of us have said that during a disaster and pandemic, was it a 25 pound disaster or 50 pound disaster? Meaning did you put on 25 pounds during it or 50? I've been blessed, I've worked at it really hard. I'm losing weight on purpose, but it's been a struggle. It's a struggle. And so next slide. And so how do we support people who have experienced trauma? Well, we enhance the protective factors, which we'll say more about. We use trauma-informed practices. And it's just hard for us as, as caregivers, you have to care for yourself in order to support others. Hello? Can I get an amen on that one? And so as we enhance protective factors, what do you do? You have health. I mean, these are things you know. I'm just letting you know that I know them too, okay? You, you, you have healthy habits. You have to have positive self-esteem, a sense of identity, uh, to do problem solving and coping. You know, it's interesting when we go, when we're stressed, we, we sometimes forget the obvious. We know that as, as clergy, when we help somebody going through a home going service and to work with the family, we know that as clinicians and we have to develop coping skills. How do you cope? with things that are unexpected with your stress. Amen. You need supportive relationships with friends. And I know as clergy people, sometimes we have trust issues, just saying, but you need to find people that you can have these supportive relationships and the caregivers in our community. Every, every clergy person needs someone to care for him or her. You need access to support services and spiritual or, and I say and, intellectual engagement. Read your sacred literature. Do some things that challenge and push your brain. I play Scrabble on my cell phone. That's probably TMI, but that helps me deal with my intellectual stuff. Amen, amen, amen. Next, next slide. So you use trauma-informed practices that you have to ensure physical, and emotional safety. And because we're talking to black and brown people, sometimes it has nothing to do with COVID, but with the violence that we see in the streets in, in New York City. And so to make sure that, that, that you're safe and that you're emotionally safe, to build social networks. You know, sometimes we're so busy being important, we forget to pick up the phone to just say, hey dude, hey sister, how you doing? And that makes a world of difference. And you never know when someone's going through. And just that one simple, wow, so-and-so cared enough to ask me how I'm doing. Wait, and then to listen for the answer. Hello, hope I'm in the right building. And, and so we have to have intergenerational relationships. I know that I feel like I have an earned doctorate. I am clueless when it comes to figuring out certain electronic devices. And some little six-year-old looks at me like, and you have a doctorate and you couldn't figure out the phone is like this and you do this. You need these intergenerational relationships. I need to know as a pastor, what's the top 10 on the R&B chart on Billboard? Because it may end up in a sermon one day or somebody make a reference. And I'm like, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Hello. So you need those to strengthen social norms that encourage healthy behaviors. Uh, you get my drift. To organize community collaborate. You, you can't beat this. You can't deal with this trauma by yourself. Amen lights. And to offer opportunities for empowerment and skill building. I think all of us at the end of this pandemic earned a PhD in Zoom. Am I in the right building? That's a that's that's a skill we've built that we can see we can see that one coming. But we ended up having to develop that. And to promote a sense of community belonging. A different workshop when I talk about what it means to be welcomed versus when you feel you belong. 
And sometimes because of what we bring to the table, we're welcome because we check the boxes. We look good on the brochure, on the website, but we don't feel as though we belong. Talk to me now. Next slide. And so you have to care for yourself and support others. Again, I know you know this. I want to let you know that I know this, all right? This is my, my test, all right? And so you have to take time just to uh, breathe, to carve out five or 10 minutes to meditate or to pray, to ground yourself in the present moment. I know as clinicians say, you know, stay, stay. I, I, hey, psychoanalysts, I deal with the past, but also how do you stay in the present? And to be honest with yourself, self-interrogation, to acknowledge your concerns and to engage your fears. You know, we, we say and we said in the seminar, you know, make friends with your shadow. Well, you know, make friends with those parts of you that may not be so comfortable, but you know they exist. And to remember you are not alone. You're not alone. You're not alone. If I was in church, I'd say, everybody say, I'm not alone. I won't do that, but you get you get the drift. And to reach out for support because you're not alone, because you're not having an Elijah complex, nobody knows the trouble I see, reach out for support. Create and sustain community. Again, show up for one another. Listen compassionately, non-judgmental. There's no shame and to practice empathy. My heart goes out to many of you because you eulogize far more people than I have during this pandemic. I don't know how you do it, but I'm glad that you do. And this is the hard part to unplug. There's so much social media. There's so much this, this, and that. And you just need moments when you're not looking at the trial. You're not looking at the violence. You're not looking at, you, you just simply unplug. And to stay healthy, to get enough sleep, to hydrate, this is a note to myself, not to you, to eat properly, proper nutrition, to exercise, and as we say in, in our religious traditions, to practice gratitude. Let gratitude be your attitude. Amen, lights. I think, is that it? There's one more. Oh yeah, so here's the takeaways. So trauma is a natural stress response to a negative life event that can become short-term or have long-term psychological effects. That's when you come see one of us as clinicians and talk about it. Faith leaders can address trauma in communities. How do you do that? You, we prioritize physical and psychological safety. We foster social connections. We encourage people, watch out now, we encourage people to seek mental health support. We tell folks going to therapy, being in group therapy is good thing. And we're not alone, help is available. and pat myself on the back, the Black Thank Baptist you. preacher stuck to 20 minutes. <laughs> Thank you so, so much for that, um, for, for sharing your own personal experience and, and, and really um, humanizing this work. Um, so at this point, we would love to take questions from the audience. You're welcome to send a question in the chat or you can unmute yourself and um, ask uh, Dr. Ashley a question directly, whatever you feel most comfortable with. If you don't ask Dr. Wyatt or ask, and I'll really be in trouble. So please, you jump in before he does. <laughs> Hi, I have a question regarding um, physical safety. Mm -hmm. I missed um, the earlier portion of the presentation. So um, when you mention physical safety, what does that mean? look like is that the setting the environment or are we referring to um people feeling safe in their bodies or with us i'm just trying to it's, um, it's clarify it, more it is it is all the above it is feeling safe in your own home it's feeling safe in your in our own skin if you will i'm gonna say it to you this way i've been doing these seminar webinars for for a while now and I've said that I have never been so grateful as I have the last few years to be able to leave my home and come back and nobody tried to violate my body in some way, shape, form through violence. Mm. 
-hmm. and that oftentimes my white clinician colleagues have no clue Mm. about the anxiety that I, as a six foot two, 200 plus pound black guy that doesn't carry a gun, that walks around and has books out that are clear, very clearly would be considered to the left, right. what it means to leave the house and not have some crazy person or persons want to take me out because they don't agree with my views. So safety encompasses all of that. And I'm a therapist. So I understand the ramifications of what I just said. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, we have uh, the good doctor in the house. He's making the house call. There you go. Doctor's in the house, and I'm not Dr. J, but anyway. <laughs> we received a question in the chat. Um, someone asked, how do we know if trauma is affecting our decision making in a negative way? Uh, the Reader's Digest version, and, 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 I'm, and this is serious with them, is that, you know, your family says that was a bad decision. You go, oh, okay, my bad. But on, on, a, on a more clinical basis, I mean, you self you self-interrogate. I mean, you have a sense that you made a bad decision. And again, rightly or wrongly, if you do, people will let you know. I'm, I'm a Black Baptist pastor. I have a whole congregation. When I blow it, they're not too shy to let me know, Pastor. That was not one of your better days. <laughs> So you have to listen when being you have to you have to be open and listen. Um, Diane Mack, please go ahead with your question. Yes, um, you said you've done a lot of hello everyone. Uh, with doing these webinars, what have you learned about the type of trauma that the congregation or clergy have reported that their members are coming forth with? And then what is their success in helping them connect to resources? or clinicians or services to address the trauma? Good, good, good question. For the most part, people are dealing with grief. I don't want to label it complicated grief yet, but they're dealing with grief. And I think it's going, I think it's going to become intensified when once we return to our buildings. Right now, it's a little bit intellectual. But once we return to the building and realize who's not there and we do social distancing, and, and in some case, I heard some pastors say the choir will no longer sit behind me and sing. Got it. You know, so we're, going to, so we're going to have different environmental pieces to it. So there's grief. There's anxiety. I mean, you know, we had some congregations that had worship during Passover and Easter. And, and I heard pastors have and the imams and rabbis express a lot of anxiety. You know, the what if. And, and and so the congregation, some people said we opened up the doors and we were surprised hardly anybody showed up. I said, you know, because that people say, no, I'm I'm not risking it. You know, I, in my congregation, we 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 have stayed on virtual. We're not going to open up anytime soon. So there's that anxiety, and and then there's this, this sense of searching and and longing, if you will. Um, one of the homegoing services I did do, people say, oh, I, oh, no, no, don't hug me. Don't hug me. Stay back. Stay back. But it's natural. That's what you do, right? And they haven't seen each other for a while. And it's, it's what you do. So those are some of the kind of things that are, I think, that are happening in our, in our congregations. And I think that too many clergy, I hope nobody on this line, but too many clergy aren't being honest with themselves. This is tough stuff. There's no easy answers. And if we get it wrong, be kind to yourself, even though you may become a news story. I get it. I get it. Dr. Ashley, we have a question in the chat. Um, what does a servant leader do when her or his church is no longer an emotionally safe place? Uh, they, enter, they immediately get help and they bring in the resources that they need. They, they may be legal depending on what kind of what what has happened it may need me to bring in le, le, legal that's why when when uh, dr white and i were taking that doing the class together we had people develop a resource list so that you have an understanding so in blue skies you visit the chief of police in blue skies you know who the local fire wardens are and, and the police captains etc and the attorneys you need for different things in blue skies so that in gray skies when things happen you can pick up your your resources and make phone calls and get the help that you need for the proper interventions Thank you so much, Dr. Ashley. Um, we're going to transition to the panel now. Um, and if there are additional questions that come up as you listen to the conversation, there will be more time at the end of this webinar. Um, Doc, uh, Reverend Dr. Wyatt, please, please take it away. 
Thank you. Thank you. I do have to say that uh, Diane Mack was a young lady uh, of teen years um, in a youth program I was affiliated with. And I think she's very close to getting her PhD. So um, I'm very happy to see her and other friends are on uh, the line. I would be remiss if I did not call out one of uh, the eminent leaders uh, in our country, uh, Sister Rosalind Fadam, who is on the line. Um, and she and uh, Lenny Dunstein uh, transformed youth services uh, at the state level, where uh, Dr. Uh, Brother Dunson wow. um, was was right there, and Raz Kadam, who has, I mean, everybody knows this <laughs> sister. So, Raz, I'm saying hello to you. Yes, and I'm saying hello back, Dr. Wyatt. You're just so kind, you know. Um, you really, really continue. And, and now, you know, you bought and find out you're connected with um, Dr. You know, Zakia. Yeah. I'm like, whoa, this is powerful. But thank you so much for recognizing and acknowledging me today. You're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, that's my community daughter. I'm her community father, and she's my community daughter. Panelists, and thank you for allowing me to stray just for a minute. Panelists. There was something I'm sure, there was something that you heard, something that you felt in the presentation that made you say, hmm, or that kindled a spark inside of you. I want you to take that feeling, that thought, put it into a question or a statement and respond to your own statement. That's your introduction. And then the second thing, uh, who you are, what you do, and um, whatever you wish to add uh, as it relates to trauma uh, from your vantage point. And then after you uh, do that, I'm going to come back with another question, and then we're going to open it up for all of you. Okay, so, so, so audience, please. You know, if you need to jot it down, if you need to put it in uh, to the chat, it will be monitored. I'm going to start off with, uh, while we're focused on Brooklyn, I'm going to for, uh, start off with my dear brother from, uh, as some would call, the Boogie Down Bronx, um, uh, Freddie Baez. Um, would you respond accordingly? Take yourself off mute, Freddie. Take yourself off mute. <laughs> there you go. Sorry about that. Uh, it's a pleasure being here, and I'm really excited about our discussion and our topic. And uh, I am a clinical um, social worker supervisor. I'm also an ordained minister, and I work at New York Psychotherapy. And I also work at another uh, more uh, faith-based clinic called Full Circle Health. So my question is, how do, how do we help people uh, face trauma? How do we help people? And from a clinical perspective, you know, my passion is psychology and theology. So I'm always looking to integrate the two. And I think that the job of a, of a clinician and uh, my uh, encouragement to clergy is that what we do is we want to help interpret what that trauma means to that person. So I'm very big in helping people look for meaning and purpose. And we, when we look at the biblical narrative, it's, it's full of stories of people facing adversity, people facing challenge. You think of a Joseph who was betrayed by family and the system is in Rikers Island. How does he make sense of this betrayal, of the suffering? Uh, you think about Job, obviously, is a classic. You think about Paul in prison, and he's writing to people, encouraging people and telling them to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. So how do we make sense of, of, of uh, suffering and our losses? And I think that for me, uh, one of the techniques I use is CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. So I want to listen to the story and I want to help people reframe that suffering, reframe that trauma 
And there is something in the literature that talks about post-traumatic growth. Uh, there's a, so, um, the authors escaped me, but I remember uh, reading an article on super survivors, the surprising link between suffering and success. And, and again, I think when you look at the biblical story and the narrative, it's, it's an admonition to people of faith. It's the good news that uh, let not this mind any longer be in you, but by the renewing of the mind, by the transformation that I can begin to make sense of, of suffering and loss. And, and I think that in general, um, wherever there is great struggle, there's going to be great success. But how do we make sense of what I just experienced? All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for the uh, uh, dive uh, in the theological world. So, Dr. Newman, um, the same question, something that made you uh, uh, say, ah, something that just resonated with you, and then you can take it from there. Okay, well, thank you again for this opportunity. What resonated from Dr. Ashley's comment was this idea of the distinction between feeling welcomed or feeling a sense of belonging. And knowing that a sense of belonging and a sense of community is so essential to who we are in our human walk, it made me think about how do we cultivate climates of comfort for people within different spaces, within certainly our churches, within our families. And even as we think about returning to work, um, returning to schools, returning to buildings, reopening, how are we going to provide people with comforts that they need? How can we make sure that we're answering questions, that we're communicating clearly? I was in a meeting earlier. I work at a college in uh, Long Island, Malloy College. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, but I'm a social work faculty member and chairperson of the social work department there. And we were talking about this reopening and who's coming back and how, and there's so much information information that people need. So we have to make sure that we are speaking to the need for people to have knowledge, but also the need for people to feel grounded and safe and comforted. And so I'll, you know, speak a little bit about some, some other initiatives and ways that those things, you know, are happening in some of the circles that I'm operating in. But I was just really struck by the need for us to take on the responsibility to consider how we cultivate climates of comfort for people and how we respond to their needs to belong. Okay. And I bring up uh, Dr. Telvis Rich um, working uh, out of uh, Long Island University in downtown Brooklyn. Um, the same uh, the same format to you. Excellent. So I'll just get right into it. Um, um, my research centers around spiritual coping. And I also use the work of, and that work is from Dr. Kenneth Pargament. And it's, it's internationally uh, recognized specifically when we think about mental health but not uh, as much in my area of social work. And, and so to, to the awesome uh, introduction to, to trauma and revisit of, of trauma by Dr. Ashley, uh, some areas that come to mind too is, you know, how do we find that place of satisfaction during this traumatic time? And how do we use our spiritual coping skills? And so that particular tenet really centers around the negative and positive uh, factors that are that we become aware of when we look for that place of peace, solace, and centeredness. And so, my thought to the thought leaders, the scholars, uh, the men and women of faith uh, is to, for those that you serve, your parishioners and those in the community, uh, be not afraid to understand that during these trying times that it is okay to have negative coping experiences. Uh, we may feel that God is far away. Uh, that we are alone. And as Dr. Ashley has said, you know, it, it's okay to be, in my opinion, uncomfortable in those moments, but it's not okay to stay in that moment. Uh, and so where does faith, where does prayer uh, intersect uh, in those moments of uncertainty at those crossroads? And so if you take some time to look at Dr. Pargament's work around spiritual coping, uh, it's a 14 uh, point scale and it gives uh, believers uh, of Christ 
uh, an opportunity to find where they are in that spectrum. And in doing so, understand what your needs are, seek the, the support of, of a pastor, community leader, or professional at all times, so you can return to that place of, of normalcy uh, is my is my takeaway from what I heard today. Mm -hmm. I did a workshop um, and I talked about doing time in COVID-19 university, that COVID uh, teaches or troubles, I could just say troubles because before COVID there was other troubles, but using COVID-19 as uh, an anchor point. My question to the panelists and Dr. Ashley, please feel free to join in. What one lesson have you learned in COVID-19 university that you would want to share with those who gather with us today? A lesson that you learn. And generally life lessons, they don't come out of joyful moments. They come out of some mm. moments, some hard moments. So share your lesson, share your life. And we can go, um, I'll go in the reverse order. I'll go uh, with Dr. Rich, then to Dr. Newman. I always got you in the middle there, daughter. Um, and then over to, to Fred, and then we'll close this phase out, and then we're going to open up for more uh, questions and comments. Yeah, I would say just briefly, um, learning to break chains of traditionality. Uh, the use of technology uh, quite often has been a pushback uh, as, a, as a former pastor of a church in metropolitan Atlanta, where many of my members were uh, considered senior in terms of age, uh, they struggled in the early 2000s to even have a conference call. And we were talking about just dialing a phone number. And, and the current pastor there has reached out to me and, and it says some of those same struggles have occurred with doing church you know, via um, you know, social media. And so what has really come from, uh, I like that COVID University, I'll have to use that as a title for an article soon, um, COVID University, is that we have to go beyond the status quo and, and break those chains of traditionality that has bound us from being able to be free and to be innovative and be progressive without losing our faith and our sense of purpose and self. Okay. I would say uh, lesson learned is so very much connected to the idea of being flexible and recognizing how in being flexible, there are opportunities to be aware of your own growth. So clearly making adjustments to remote work, remote therapy, remote operations, and, and taking on additional responsibilities to provide services in very innovative ways and convening forums like what we're doing today was part of my lessons learned and recognizing how I needed to care for myself in order to do that. Uh, time, determining the essential nature of something. Do I need to say yes to this or can I say no to that? And really being able to look at how to be intentional about determining determining how I was going to utilize my time, make use of my treasures, um, uh, honor God with my talents in certain projects. So in being flexible, still learning lessons about the essential nature of an activity, the essential nature of a thought, the essential nature of an emotion, and really being able to navigate it for the purposes that would be aligned with, with how I'm moving forward in my life. Okay, ready? Well, I mean, I think for me, this whole idea of the new normal, uh, and I think to be the reality is that, again, when you look at the biblical narrative, when you look at, at civilization, that there's always a new normal. I mean, this is not something really new and that we're always going to be facing challenge. The, the question is, how do I adopt to the challenge? And I think the other big thing that came home for me was the, I think the American sense of entitlement that you know, the reality is that a lot of the world has been facing this. I'm not sure where I'm gonna live. I'm not sure where my food is coming from. So for me, the American church has been spared. 
and so we got we got fat we got comfortable now now it's coming to me and wow how do we handle this but if you go to south america if you go to africa if you go to india people have been dealing with these struggles for the longest you know mm. so this is not anything new but it, how do i adopt so i think that's that's the biggest thing this thing about the new normal you look at the biblical story every generation in that story has been adopted to the new normal i remember that sir i may give citations um dr ashley this is a phrase we've used before but it took new meaning for me during the pandemic that on the other side of every exit is an entrance and this we've exited some ways of being some ways of doing but on the other side have been some wonderful new opportunities that we may not have availed ourselves to if we were continuing in our traditional routines, if you will. And for me, on a personal level, I exited from full-time academia and went into this, in, entered in, into these new relationships and doing, doing full-time psychoanalysis and marriage and family therapy and so forth and so on. And uh, you know, I'm probably busier now than I was in academia because I'm doing things that I want to do and give me energy and give me life. And in a very real sense, I'm my own boss, if you will, in that regard. And 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 so on, on, on the side of on the other side of every exit is an is an entrance. I've entered into new ways of being with my family that perhaps my schedule didn't allow to happen before. New ways of being with the congregation that again, you know, scheduling didn't allow. So it's an, an exit on the one hand, but an entrance on, on the other. Thank you. I was reading uh, one of the things, one of the gifts of the pandemic is that I've, I've just been reading. And one uh, particular work that I read uh, was quoted that we strive to be free from things. And we sometimes ignore what we're free to, like free to do. Mm -hmm. And one of the liberating uh, gifts that we can give ourselves is to think about what are we free to do um, within these dire times and circumstances. So hold on to that. There is a question that, that, that came through technology and I'm going to phrase it this with the way that it was given. How would you recommend in a day and a time where uh, counseling, where therapy uh, for many uh, in our communities uh, is looked upon as scant or to be avoided or I don't need help, whatever the rationale on the other side uh, is, how would you suggest encouraging people who need help who need help, I underscore bold uh, and put an exclamation point after that, who needs help, how would you uh, uh, implore them to seek that help? What is the language? How would you do it? Have you had success or have you come up against a wall? Kind of filter all of that through your response. And as you do that, let me say hi to Selena uh, my, 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 my goddaughter, she just popped up, there we go, Sister LeBron from New York, a psychiatric, uh, I got the name, but it'll come to me, uh, center. So with that said, respond as you see, um, in the order. I'm not giving order now. I don't want to be controlling. So how would you encourage someone to seek counseling, therapy, et cetera, et cetera? See, I don't give the order, nobody speaks. Um, could you jump on that, uh, 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 Zakia? Sure, I, I thought Brother Freddie was gonna go. I saw he came off mute, so I was, I was patiently waiting. Oh. Um, I think just in terms of one, one the, the key point that you make that you're underscoring about, they realize that they need help. Um, I think they also should deal with the idea that they're deserving of help. 
and that because they have a need that they can have operate in that awareness of the need, but then couple it with the responsiveness of how do I get that need met? And so I would encourage people, and, and we all know people who have those needs that need to get those services. We have to send messages to them that they're deserving of that help, that help is available in multiple forms, uh, self-help, podcasts, books, you know, music, things that'll lift their spirit, the informal and the formalized helping systems that exist um, in order to make that connection to be responsive to that need. So I think our language is important, um, but also the whole idea of worthiness. There's a lot of shame that we have to bind and that we have to recognize um, uh, that some of the anti-stigma messages and the, the, the myths of the strong this person, the strong that person that get in the way of people's um, ability to accept what they need. And the last thing I'll say on this is people have to be connected to their own capacity. Sometimes we just don't have it to do, you know, and it's a burden and it's a struggle and it's, you know, oh God, I just can't, you know, connect to some of the things that I know I need to do for myself. So we need to have that awareness ourselves, but also have people in our lives who can check us and be like, mm, you know, you're falling off your square a little bit, sis, mm -hmm. and, and really say it in love so that we're able to affirm mm -hmm. and to receive what we need. Thank you, yeah. thank you. I didn't see uh, Freddie coming off mute. Uh, Freddie? Yeah, what I wanna say, I, I tend to get more of the phone calls from the concerned uh, uh, mother, concerned family member, friend. You know, my experience is that the people who are concerned are the ones who tend to make that phone call. Yeah. And so what I find is I'm coaching them, um, uh, role playing with them in terms of how do I approach this? How do I have that discussion? And in the end, you know, if it really comes to it, you, you're gonna have to call 911 depending on how bad this thing begins to escalate. So my experience has been mostly um, the secondary people surrounding this person out of concern and empowering them to, to have that dialogue and have the honest discussion. And when I speak uh, to, to ministers, my thing is, you know, whatever you say from that pulpit, amen. But there's certain topics that are not spoken to uh, on a Sunday morning. And you're also letting the congregation know by the absence of certain topics that, you know, God's not interested. We're not gonna talk about that. And the last thing I'll say is that some things are not uh, for a Sunday morning, all right? But in, in a men's fellowship, in a women's fellowship, in a young adults ministry, that's where some of these issues can around self-care and the need to get to get help can, can be uh, talked about. All right. Dr. Ritz. And honestly, I, I I echo what's been said. Uh I, I truly agree who was there. And, and if I could just echo a little louder this idea of a network, you know, ensuring that when those um, moments of, of trying and test arise, being connected to a network is, is very important. Um, goes back to that whole Verizon thing of who's in your, you know, your top five, right? Uh, who can you call? Um, who can you lean on? And know that when you share, it's in a safe space, but also the person receiving it can code and decode that information and be able to uh, assist appropriately for the good of all. Dr. Ashley? Yeah, I would say amen to all that's been said as well. And 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 like 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 um like Freddie, most of my people have been calling it someone's mother, someone's spouse that says, you know, help. How do I get them to come to therapy? How do I get them to get the help that they need? And and but then there's also been this kind of a new group that's emerged in the last couple of months, which have been black men saying, I am in over my head and I realize it. And that's, that's been, that's kind of a new thing. Usually I'm trying to, you know, coach them to come then like, no, no, I realize I'm in over my head. You know, one too many colleagues, friends died, whatever the case may be. And so that, that's been kind of a new experience. And in some cases, in some cases with respect to the clergy, I say, you know, this is not counseling. It's consult. It's I'm doing a consult and I'm coaching you. you go, oh, cause you know, I don't, I, God forbid, Reverend doctor with 5,000 members, you go to therapy. It, it, it's coaching and they go, oh, okay. And, you know, and I'll say, so, you know, you're okay. Tell me about your crazy members. No, I'll show up for that because I got a whole bunch of those. Okay, well, let's talk about your, your crazy members. Then I'll say somewhere along the line, so how might you have handled it differently? 
giving your personality, your temperament, and your history. Because the members are crazy. I got it. It's not you. It's them. But, you know, let's let's talk about those crazy members. And, oh, yeah, sure. what time, Doc? Let me know. <laughs> okay. So I, using... Just real quick, can I mention one thing? I want to echo yes, this sir. idea that when I work with men of color, especially the last five years, I don't mention therapy, right. life coaching, right. you know, uh, that kind of that kind of model right. works better with men. Yeah. Uh, they can handle this idea. Of, uh, well, I have a life coach, but uh, right. I'm in therapy now for the life coach and not a problem. Right. And Sophie, let me chime. Let me Ooh. say this quickly too, uh, because that's an area very uh, important to me. Um, I would recommend for those that haven't read it, Dr. Waldo E. Johnson's book, and it really centers around this idea of black men don't cry, and 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 so when we when we internalize that, which needs to be exposed and verbalized, what happens is we can combust, and 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 that is no good for the individual and the community, and so there's there's truly uh coding that we must use in in therapy in our church so we we have to use our word choices um carefully at the same time we do the same work and not only with our adult and i'm referring to um african-american males an area that i that i write about uh, now but also our young boys our, our teen boys those adolescents that will become those adult men who don't cry uh, and the actions and reactions therein can be uh, very pitiful, pitiful uh, towards the uh, impact of good or bad in terms of success in life. Listen at this so point. allow our boys to cry, allow them to share, uh, uh, hug them if you know them, right? Uh, mm -hmm. In a very safe place, uh, allow them to talk and we become active listeners and, uh, and watch the beauty of the Lord uh, work through them. Uh, because that's the same way we do with our girls. I think we've just been trained and culturally it's a norm that our boys are tough and hard and our girls are sweet and soft and they wear pink and the boys are in the dark blues and, and they're manning up. Well, I think to man up means that you need to speak out as well. And I think we're called upon as leaders to create that space for our young boys of color and men of color. Mm -hmm. Can I just add, I think it's, a, I think it's important as if you're a pastor to set the table and say that going to therapy, getting help is acceptable. And so, you know, all my congregation, I've always said, folks, you know, you know, pastor is certifiable and I go, yeah, tell us about it. <laughs> and so I go to therapy. Oh yeah, we're glad you go. Well, you need to go also like, oh, okay. So. Well, it's trying to, I'm so excited by the reaction and the, um, the thought of uh, the level of thought to this question. For me, uh, metaphors are real important and can be used when I do men's groups. I may just ask the question, um, what is your kryptonite? And for those who don't know, kryptonite was the only thing that could weaken Superman. Uh, and we all have something that can weaken us or take our, our strength away. On your point, uh, Dr. Rich, in terms of telling men who are called to mentor when I do mentor training or whatever, I wrote a book on mentoring. Um, before you reach out to a young boy, reach into the hurt, lost little boy inside of you. And this works for women. Women have a hurt, lost little girl. That hurt child knows more about the adult than the adult even could imagine. And in that communion, there are conversations that can happen from the adult to that hurt, lost little boy. Start your mentoring right then and there. All right. So now the last round, and then we're going to open it up. If you had, talk about metaphors now, if you had a gift, not money, if you had a gift to give either to uh, a faith leader to a house of, of worship or to someone who is in need, what would that gift be? You smiling? I see two smiles, I see two stares and a partridge and a pear tree. Um, all right, Dr. Newland. Okay. I'll say, you know, that that's that's a great question. And I 
you know, really will just sit with the idea of what abilities, what superpowers, so to speak, would I want to gift to um, faith leaders. And uh, in addition to just supporting uh, people's mental health and emotional well-being, it would really be, you know, three words that just happen to be like, oh, now I'm not a Baptist preacher, but I am Baptist. But the words are recognition, recovery, and restoration. And really being able to think about how important it is to recognize. You know, there's a verse of scripture that says in Song of Solomon, they made me the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyards I have not kept. They made me the keeper, right? You know, but there's some things I need to do for myself, but that's a recognition right there. Really being able to speak to that awareness recovery and really thinking about what's necessary to recover from some of the realities that we all experience that cause us distress and pain, and then really having a vision for and a strategy to achieve restoration. So the capacity to think through those things, to develop the types of responsive programming that happens in men's ministry, women's ministry, youth ministry, management, uh, marriage ministry, community outreach that follows that model of recognition, recovery and restoration. Mm. Where did you find these people? Somebody could preach that. that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, it's good as Jack, daughter. All right, somebody else. Well, I'm going to say that I think, uh, thinking about this, um, the capacity to be a consultant and, and to meet with leadership and help them think about what wellness looks like for that particular congregation and in, in that neighborhood. So what does that look like for you? And can I come with you, walk with you and help you think about it? And whether it's curriculum, whether it's messages, whether it's, you know, uh, we I have experienced at least five different churches that have um, been willing to sponsor. Uh, we give discounts for, for some of the most neediest people to come. And there's even two churches that have basically mandated all their leaders to at least have a screening on depression and anxiety. Hmm. So, right. That's a yeah, reason. one in Boston and one here in the Bronx. So all their leaders are coming for at least anxiety and depression screen. And they're, you know, we're giving them a, a discount, discount, and they're, they're going to sponsor that. So, okay. All right. Dr. Ashley. I'm going to get in trouble now. I've been I've been a good 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 true trooper all day, so I'm going to get in trouble. Um, courage, courage. I've, I've met with a number of pastors who said I don't want to open, but my board wants me to open, or I want to open. My board said, my board said, my board said, and I'd say I'm sorry. Is is the barkey say pastor and you're that person? And they look at me like yes. And so at some point. Can you live with, you open up and people get sick and die and you, and you have to live with that. Can you live with that? Can you live with that a decision is made and it's an unpopular one, but you can look yourself in the mirror. And then then I do go into my, my sermon, my sermonette and say, I don't know, may, maybe, I'm a, maybe I'm delusional, but in the congregation that has my name on the marquee and has my name on the bulletin and it's for me and my house, here's what we're gonna do. Next question. Got you, got you, Dr. Ritz. I would say just in the words of uh, the late great Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, the words that forgiveness is not an occasional act. And so it's it's quite important as, as pastors and ministers is to understand that we're not just the tellers and the sharers of the word, but when we slip and fall, when we make decisions that are not uh, popular, that we have the ability to forgive those that are not in alignment with us. And as Dr. King also said to, I think a middle school group um, before speaking before thousands, he said, no matter what you do, always be moving. And in Latin that's movir and that's motivation. So to pastors, uh, practice forgiveness, but always move forward as you forgive. Uh, being stagnant before, during and after COVID is just unacceptable. And sometimes we have to close that Bible, folks, and live the truth, right? And be motivated by what is right. And I think that echoes the sentiment of Dr. Ashley as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, that was really, really a nourishing meal that was uh, shared right here. So we're gonna go to, uh, Sophie, we're gonna go to questions. 
Um, we have about 22 minutes. So we want to try and get as much out as possible. And your question may not necessarily be for you, but it could be that you're asking it to carry to somebody else. We have to be nurturers of each other and to use what was given to us. Uh, as I say, I am a proponent of information and I kind of move away from inflammation. Mm. We want to give information that can help somebody. So the doors, not of the church, but the doors for questions are open. If it's directed to a person, please direct it. And if it's general, only I will just maybe point and have a couple of you respond, unless you just got a drive in me. I'd like Don't. to elevate one question from the chat that I received from two different people. Uh, mm. doc, Dr. Rich, um, you mentioned a book um, uh, that, that you've used in your research um, related to negative coping skills um, and black men. Would you mind sharing the name of that book? And if I'm describing it wrong, apologies. Uh, yes, let me... Um, let me look that up. I'm, the author is Dr. Waldo E. Johnson. And so um, let me look it up uh, behind the, the screen here, or maybe you can, Sophie. <laughs> yes, I will. And list that in. Um, he is a clinician and a social worker, um, I believe at the University of Chicago, and a thought leader uh, specifically around African-American men and, and mental health. Okay. Um, I would crack. Um information and data team is now looking up and researching. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> yeah, and for those with interest in, in areas of spiritual coping, I would I would say spend some time looking at the work of Dr. Kenneth Pargament. Uh, and he is a full professor at Bowling Green uh, State University, which I believe is in, in Kentucky. And also you can take a look at yours, Julie's work in that area as well, uh, Telvis Rich. And, and for those that are interested, I'm actually just completed as a manuscript that's been submitted for, for publication and that looks at um, black men in social work and their coping skills uh, during COVID and in light of the recent global protest when we think about Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. And then also a book um, manuscript that's been submitted to Rutledge Publishing that looks at the lives of black men in social work, academics, those are in practice, and, and students. And it's from the perspective of utilizing spirituality as a coping mechanism in, in work settings where often we are ostracized, excluded, and not engaged. So that those are some powerful works. And for those with interest in that, please reach out to me. I would love to have um, collaborators uh, and laborers in, in that ministry as well. Wow, wow, what a great offer. Did you find it, Sophie? Yes, I've put it in the chat. I hope it's the correct one. Uh, if it's not, Dr. Rich, uh, let me know. All right. So the doors are open. Um, questions and statements. I may cut off statements, but questions, if you do have a question, uh, please feel free uh, uh, to, to pose it. And if it's to a person, fine. If not, whoever feels uh, uh, like stepping forward, please feel free to do. And once again, if you'd prefer to share your question privately, you can chat it to me um, and I will bring it to the group. Okay, and while we're doing that, because Fonzo is always on the move. If there is a question that a panelist wants to pose to another panelist, feel free to do that in the next three minutes that we have. <laughs> Pastor Booker, I see your mouth moving, but I don't hear your audio. Pastor Booker, please turn uh, on your mic. He's not muted. Um, 
Oh, so it so seems like there might be a technical <laughs> issue. You're welcome to chat me the question and I will do my best to relay it. So I have a question is to the analysts and I guess also to the people on the um, that's in the room with us. Given all this rich information and um, suggestions and strategies that have been offered in the spaces that you stand or the people that you are that's on your team, do you know how do you actually refer or access those services and or is that a challenge for you and you're not sure where to get them? So we know Thrive New York exists, but then people may have challenges with the city system, right? But where else do you send the people to get the type of care and um, treatment that may be necessary? So I'll, I'll start there. Yeah, and hello, Diane. Good, good, good seeing you on Zoom, sis. Um, so I, I just want to lift a resource, but then also speak to uh, an observation. So there is um, the Institute of the Black World 21st Century convenes the Black Family Summit, which is a compilation of 28, I believe, uh, Black organizations, many healing organizations like the All Healers Mental Health Alliance that Dr. Ashley referenced um, that our dear ancestor, Dr. Phyllis Harrison Ross um, started and now is convened by Dr. Anel Prim. And many of you may know uh, Dr. Benny Prim, who's Dr. Anel Prim's father. So we have the Black psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, uh, doctors, nurses. And so through a grant from the Casey Foundation, we operate a community cares listening line. It is a toll-free number where people in the New York, New Jersey area can call for emotional support and resource information. Now we started the line, uh, went operational in uh, July and we're still operating and we're encouraging people to call, particularly persons working through the pandemic as essential workers, first responders, and just needing to unburden and, and feel support. We have three core areas that we train on, the, the, the healing value of hope, uh, coined by our own uh, Reverend Dr. Wyatt, empathic listening, as well as the uh, African philosophy of Ubuntu, which is I am because we are and because we are, therefore I am, that community philosophy. And so that grounds us in, in, in how we approach uh, the work of the listening line. Um, I will uh, ask Sophie to uh, forward it in the chat as well as uh, sending a link out when emails go out. But that can help as a connection. Now, what we're noticing is what but um, Brother Freddie said in terms of people calling in, trying to get services for their family members. I'm concerned about my young adult nephew. I'm concerned about my grandson. A lot of grandparents calling in looking for ways to connect. Um, so we really find that it's so important to get a lot of information out about mental health services, particularly within communities of color that are uh, able to meet the need. There are some challenges with access because many clinicians um, may not be available because so much is happening during this pandemic that their own practices are full, but we are trying to have a regular way of understanding how to increase access for people looking for services. So I'll share that information so that the people know the phone number, can look at our website to get a better sense of uh, the project that we're operating. Thank you, Dr. Newland. I have a question in the chat here, which I think is incredibly relevant. Um, how do you handle a member who clearly needs a mental health evaluation, but is afraid to find out the diagnosis? Well, I'm gonna say that this is basically the same idea of having someone that you're concerned about and you can clearly see they need the help um, or they're confiding certain things in you that are alarming. Um, and you, you know, initially you're gonna tell them straight out, you know, here's uh, a, a phone number, you know, make a phone call. They're not doing it. So at that point, this person's not ready and it's, it's vital at that point just to keep the door open and uh, to just show a lot of love, a lot of concern. And, um, you know, there's this whole idea of the drop of water hitting the rock. It's not an event, it's a process. And I think we just need to be consistent with that message 
of affirmation, love, and we're going to walk with you through this. Anybody else? You know, I, and my, my practice, maybe New Jersey practice might be a little different. Most people walk in the door with that question. They walk in saying, so doc, tell me I'm not crazy. Or some variation of that. Um, or, you know, or what's normal. And usually I'll say, you know, so, you know, normal is overrated. You know, normal is contextual in, in some regards. Or I'll say, you know, so, you know, what, when you say crazy, what do you mean? I'm crazy and I'm your therapist. So, you know, I mean, you know, it, it, it's some... I'm very careful because of because of Dr. Ross, because of Dr. Prim and others, and I really fight with this. I said earlier, not to patho not to be so quick to pathologize, because we've experienced, and you know, you know that in PI, you know that in Bell, you know, we experience so much racialized trauma that we never get to talk about. It's not in the DSM five. It's not in most of our graduate school education, and 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 so you know, other people want to pathologize our reaction and response to their to their racism. Talk to me now, somebody. <laughs> so because of that, you know, I, I tend to not want to pathologize and say like, you know, as I said earlier, you know, tell me your stories. I want to hear your stories of struggle, your stories of survival, your stories of searching, your stories of strength. You know, you went through some crazy stuff and somehow you're still standing. So instead of doing the deficit model, let's do the strength model. Let's do the positive piece. You know, as, as a person of the African diaspora, I'm hearing all the time what I can't do, what I'm, you know, what I'm not. Let's talk about the strength that it takes to survive and navigate this craziness, especially this past year. And so for me, I, I, I find that African American folks, people, the Bioc folks, whatever you term you want to use, we spend our entire life defining what we're not. I'm not violent. I'm not full of rage. I'm not too Afrocentric. I'm not a threat. Because when we don't do that, we end up on the wrong side of a national news story. And so to, to come to me for, for coaching or therapy, I want to talk about what you are. You're strong. You're beautiful. You're wonderful. You're resilient. You're able. Thank you. Is there another question, Sophie? Not in the chat. Not in the chat. I would like to, because um, we do have resources. We have resources on the line. Uh, as I mentioned, one of my mentees, uh, Selena LeBron is here uh, from New York Psychother Psychotherapy and Counseling Center. You can just give a quick minute on what you do, where you are, because this is all hands on deck time. And the Lone Ranger or the Lone Rangerette, those days are over. Um, we have to come together, work together, sow seeds together. Selena? Thank you so much, Dr. Reverend Wyatt. Um, um, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you and just to hear all of the great um, knowledge that is being shared today. Um, you know, we, uh, of course, uh, uh, NYPCC also has a passion for, you know, mental health and helping our community members. Um, and one of those things that we take pride in is that we're open seven days a week. We do not have a wait list because we know the importance of mental health. So having someone wait a month out for an appointment is just like, it boggles our mind. So we take pride in not having a wait list. Um, we are also flexible with evening hours. Um, uh, uh, right now, due to the pandemic, our clinics have been closing um, at 6 p.m., but our telehealth services are still open till 10 p.m. Um, and again, we're open on the weekends. Uh, we're looking uh, forward to opening up fully, um, but right now we're just trying to maintain safe. Uh, we do have clients that come in um, as we're, we are practicing social distance. Um, and you'll be so a lot of people um, ask and say, oh, do you, are you, are you even getting clients in, in person? And we're like, yeah. Um, we have to remember that everyone's stuck in the house right now. And there's a lot of people who can't, you know, who don't feel comfortable speaking with a therapist with Johnny and, and her five kids in the background, you know, and they don't feel, you know, and so they, they, they prefer to come out or even just to catch up 
of a breath of fresh air and have somewhere to go because they haven't gone anywhere. So um, we have remained open throughout the pandemic, um, helping those in need. Um, we also have an outreach team, which I'm a part of. We, um, you know, just campus the areas for um, folks who are in need of services. We, you know, we, we share information. Um, we have also been handing out bags and hand sanitizer, just, just the little things just to help our community members. You know, we're all struggling um, and we're just reminding them that we're all in this together. They're not alone. Mm -hmm. You know, there is help. There is, there are resources. Um, um, even if it's not for mental health, right? Maybe they need to know when's the next food pantry. Maybe they need to know when's the next, you know, um, you know, a place where they can find coats or 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 shoes or you know or clothing for the children or books, right? Even right. Um, we are there to help them. So please, right. please, please, um, you know, take down my information and my number, and you you all can reach me at any time. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Mm -hmm. And one of the links that I made, Sophie, is her organization with Thrive. There is so much going on that we can take advantage of. Um, there's a mental health toolkit for our faith and community leaders. And in that toolkit, I was <laughs> one of my uh, one of my lines was, "What you pray for, your tax dollars probably already paid for." Um, there are a number of faith and clergy uh, uh, leaders, there are a number of community leaders um, that may not be aware of the resources uh, that are out there. And there is nothing wrong with using free resources, and especially good resources. And I think this is a good segue, uh, Sophie, uh, back back, back, back to you. For me, I just want to say that we are in uh, uh, extraordinary uh, times. And I do believe that the learning that we can get from, from, from these times and even times ago is that we're in this together and that we can work, we can search, uh, for ways of knowing that we can share with others. So with that said, I'm going to go back over to, 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 to Sophie, and she is going to talk about some resources that are available for folk who have made it this far um, on, 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 on the webinar call. And also, I want to thank uh, the panelists of uh, Absolutely, absolutely an in-depth uh, conversation. Uh, your, your light was shining, uh, your ability to spark interest and to, to, to lead as you are being followed uh, to destinations that we needed to end up in. So thank you, thank you, thank you very much to all who are on the call. Uh, people that I know, and I'm not calling out a whole lot of names because that would be a whole nother thing, but spread the word. If this uh, 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 meant something and if you had the thought, oh, I wish so-and-so was on the call. Well, guess what? We got another one a week from today. Um, uh, and that is a citywide uh, all hands on deck call. Um, and um, while I love, I love all of the presenters, we'll have um, a different set of pres uh, presenters. So we'll go from there and that's what keeps, you know, each one kind of uh, opens up another way of knowing. So I want to thank you panelists, blessings to you uh, for your sacrifice. For those that are interested and are based in Brooklyn, please look up Dr. Rich in terms of what is going on there. I will ring you to find out more about some of uh, what you mentioned in terms of manuscripts, in terms of thinking, writing, talking, and sharing. So with that said, bless you. Um, I move it back over to our, our engineer, extraordinaire. <laughs> engineer, not in technology terms. We've got somebody for that, but just moving the train. And uh, we all thank you for all that you do. 
Thank you so much, Reverend Dr. Wyatt. Um, and I echo your thanks to the panelists and, and to the audience today for participating. Um, before we close, I just want to emphasize the real one of the morals of the story, which is that you're not alone and help is available. Um, the Mayor's Office of Thrive NYC um, offers over 30 different programs. Um, and our goal is to reach people um, who may not otherwise be able to access mental health services. Um, and so I will follow up next week um, with a link to our website, which includes a number of free resources. And I'd like to note that those resources and services are available regardless of immigration status. Um, they're free um, and they are um, open to the public. Um, we have services for young people, for uh, individuals with a history of justice involvement, um, people who are uh, experiencing homelessness, people who have experienced um, abuse and neglect. And so these services are there, as Reverend Dr. Wyatt says, what you pray for, this we already have, um, it exists. Um, and I think we've learned a lot today about how we can help to make connections to mental health services and support, which you know is, is, is one of the hardest parts of this process. Um, and so on that note, We've also uh, put together a resource guide um, that focuses on trauma um, and really highlights and underscores some of what we learned today. Um, and there is a section in that guide which provides you some tips on how to initiate a conversation about mental health support um, to increase the likelihood that the person you're talking to um, will actually accept the referral and make the connection. And so I invite you um, to please take a look um, in addition, I will uh, share the resources that were mentioned today. I will share the helpline that Dr. Newland mentioned. I will share um, the resources provided by Dr. Baez um, at the Full Circle Clinic and as well as Selena LeBron. Um, if there's anything that you'd like to add, I emailed you all this morning with the Zoom details. Uh, please contact me directly um, and I'll be happy to include those. Um, so without further ado, I thank you so much for being here today and also for all the work you are doing to support New Yorkers. You really are on the front lines um, making, making really important uh, change in this world. So thank you. Um, and uh, I hope to see you next week if you can join us. And if not next week on May 6th, we'll be hosting a, a, a webinar on vicarious trauma, which looks at how all of this affects you as leaders um, and how you can protect your own mental health while serving others. So thank you. Um, have a wonderful, wonderful spring day today. Everybody get a chance to wave, get a chance to wave. Hey, oh, there you go.